Good afternoon, and welcome to the official start of today's World Oregon webinar on the Great Decisions Program we're doing in cooperation with our partners, the Foreign Policy Association. Today's talk is on changing demographics uh, with Professor uh, Ethan Sherrigan, Director of the Population Research Center at Portland State University. We're uh, thrilled to have this experienced demographer joining us. I'll say a little bit more about him in just a minute, but just uh, first a few words. Um, again, for those of you who um, joined us last week, you probably heard from Tim uh, uh, for this year's uh, Great Decisions. A couple things of note. One is, again, it's all virtual because of uh, the ongoing pandemic. Uh, uh, no later than a week after the program, the last week's one, if you missed it, will be posted on YouTube. So uh, Tim will post that link in the chat here in a little bit. But last week's uh, is already up on YouTube about space. Uh, in fact, there's the link. And um, if you've ordered a book from the Foreign Policy Association, they are taking longer to ship because of back orders. We apologize. We have no control over that. Um, if you have any questions, you can direct them directly to the Foreign Policy Association. Most people have got them. Some are still waiting for theirs in the mail. Apologize. We do not have any additional copies to sell because of the pandemic. It's just not logistically feasible. Uh, also, this year, there's a couple of new things. One is we are trying to do surveys on our Zoom programs to get a better sense of how the experience is for you, suggestions. So uh, that will probably automatically pop up at the end of the webinar. We'll also post in the chat um, the link. Uh, I would also note that this uh, uh, webinar on demographics is one of the ones we're going to have a special uh, discussion group session with Portland State University's Global Leadership and management specialization in the Masters of Public Administration po program. Tim has posted some information on that in the chat. That follow-up discussion is next Thursday, January 27th at noon Pacific, uh, and, and, and free to register for that. Uh, details on the link or also on our website. If you are a series participant, then you should already be getting a know before you go email every Thursday before Great Decisions, which has links to all these issues. If it doesn't show up in your inbox, check your spam filters. We found that many people have their spam, uh, it, for whatever reason, it uh, filters things out. So if you mark us as a trusted sender, it should pop into your inbox. Um, because if you've registered, you will be getting information in the know before you go in addition to the weekly, um, uh, the weekly posting. And uh, again, as mentioned, um, someone just posted in the chat, as I, as I mentioned just a minute ago, we have no control over the books. We uh, ask you direct those questions to the Foreign Policy Association. All we know is that book shipments have been delayed. Even our like copy that Tim has as a reference uh, uh, for Tim and my copies were also delayed and we just barely got them. So apologize for that. Tim's posting the website there where you can check in with the Foreign Policy Association. So at the end of the program, I'll talk about next week's coming up. Um, and I'm now going to ask our expert a demographer to join us online. He um, has uh, a wealth of experience, a PhD from University of Pennsylvania, in addition to a bachelor's from University of Washington and a master's from UC Cal Berkeley. He's worked in California, up here in Oregon. Pennsylvania. It just has a great deal of uh, experience in demography, including on uh, demog demographics, excuse me, and demography. And we're thrilled to have him join us today for um, today's program. And I'm passing the floor over to you. Welcome. Thanks very much, Derek. And uh, thank you, Tim, also. I'm happy to be here. The Population Center at, at PSU, uh, for those of you not familiar with our work, um, we are part of a national network of applied demography centers where we conduct translational research to apply cutting edge methods to research questions about US cities, counties, and, and states. So when Tim invited me to talk about global population issues, I was happy to have a chance to revisit these big picture questions that in my view, make demography such an exciting field. So um, then I saw that you were reading an article by Joseph Chamey, a noted demographer and, and former director of the UN Population Division. Uh, Oregon's very lucky to have uh, Mr. Chamey, and the article that you read is a, is a fantastic overview of where things stand globally. So I can't hope to do a better job uh, than he did of outlining those issues. Um, so instead, I'm going to focus on taking a deep dive into a couple aspects um, that you've read about uh, in order to sometimes give you a slightly different perspective 
um, or more insight, nuanced view into how demographers think about and argue about these, these issues. So to start with, let's consider uh, population growth. How much, where, and why? It's a major feature of the article, and I'm going to focus on, on that topic. My goals are to, by the end of my talk, give you a sense of how we measure and quantify populations, and then also discuss this question of population growth. Is it, is it good or bad? Uh, how, how much should, are we going to have? What can we do about it? Um, and I'll tell that story through the lens of the experience in three countries, France, China, and Japan. So to start with, a, a, a mechanic has a set of tools to use in diagnosing and repairing a car. And demographers have a set of tools that we use to measure and characterize a population and to predict how one thing changing will affect another. However, Unlike mechanics, our vehicles, human societies, are like an engine that's constantly rewiring and redesigning itself. We have to check that our tools and our mental maps of the world don't become outdated. And at the same time, most of us, or all of us, have driven a car, and many of us know or, or think we know something about how they run. We, we see news stories uh, all the time about divorce rate, birth rate, COVID-19, life expectancy, so we, we all have formed opinions and beliefs um, as we experience these demographic events in our own lives. So demography is also one of the most accessible social sciences, although a lot of the inner workings remain hidden to us or have changed just by the time we think we understood them. So one of my goals today is to impress on you that hidden complexity of demography. For example, how can family size be staying stable when the birth rate is going down? Why does it seem sometimes like giving money to families uh, has an effect on the birth rate, but not always. So we'll lift up the hood together for a minute. We'll get straight to one of the most fundamental questions. How do we know how many people there are in the world? We read with confidence that there are 7.9 billion people in the world in 2021. How did we get that figure? And, and how confident should we be uh, about its accuracy? So demography, especially formal demography, has three pillars. The first is a census. The second is vital registration, births and deaths. And the third is migration. If all three of these data sources are perfect, we can give a precise account of population size. In fact, even if the last two of those are perfect, vital registration and migration, we can also precisely estimate the population size without a census. For example, before the 2020 census, the US Census Bureau demographers did an exercise. What if we had to count the entire population in 2020 and we had no federal census? They counted every record of a birth or a death or an immigration uh, since the start of the 20th century. Conveniently, we know that every person alive today in 2020 or alive in last year moved here in 1910 or later. And also conveniently around that time, we have more or less complete registration of births and deaths and, and pretty good immigration records. So by adding up all of the births and new arrivals and then removing all the deaths, the census demographers came up with a purely demographic estimate of 332.6 million, million people in 2020, which proved to be just 0.3% higher than the 2020 census enumeration of 331.4 million. But not every country has a complete registration of births and deaths and migration. And also because we only track international migration in the US and not movement across state borders, we couldn't even track state populations. So we couldn't use that result to apportion Congress. Census remains, uh, censuses remain critically important around the world. This map shows how recently each country has taken one. Green means within the past five to 10 years, and then other colors mean longer ago, uh, or some of these countries uh, appear in gray, which means that censuses are, are not planned or they're just not, not used anymore. And I can talk about why. Um, but historically, there are a few activities a government could do that were more fraught than the census. We take for granted um, that we generally want to be counted because it means federal funding for our communities and representation. 
But in many parts of the world, for much of history, being counted just meant having your household inventory for taxation or for conscription. So because of the expense or controversy of a population census, uh, there are many countries that have not had one in a long time. And uh, this is a topic that I find really fascinating. And, and uh, I encourage any interested readers to go out and pick up um, Andrew Whitby's book, uh, came out last year, The Sum of the People, for an accessible and interesting history of census taking around the world. But there are a variety of things we can do to count people when there hasn't been a census and there isn't good vital registration. So to count births and deaths, for, for example, um, the UN, the WHO, research centers like the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington, run complex models to synthesize um, data from dozens of surveys into a single best estimate in, of births or deaths. And I'll talk more about that in a bit, but there are also innovative approaches to replacing a census. One of the most promising ones is geospatial approach. Uh, that under development by several teams working independently at the University of Southampton, US Census Bureau, Oak Ridge National Labs, uh, among others. And these models use satellite imagery to identify signs of human settlement and population density. These are then calibrated to a known population size and then can be extrapolated based on changes in the imagery. So in fact, this system is actually somewhat like the one we use for tracking growth in Oregon below the county level. We have a census every 10 years, but we produce population estimates every year. And at the county level, we have relatively good data on births and deaths and migration. But for cities, we rely on a model that correlates housing with population size. And so we translate new houses into population growth. This method tends to be pretty accurate. Uh, we were within a half of 1% when we compared our estimates to the decennial census in both 2010 and in 2020. But I mentioned that some countries don't do censuses at all. And in some cases, that's because countries have a national population registration system. These systems are different from the US in that they are oriented around people as the basic unit of record. And what that means, our system is set up to track events. For example, when uh, our birth certificate records a birth, it's not attached to a person's ID, like a SSN. Uh, and when we die, our SSNs are recorded, not for statistical purposes, but just as an afterthought to prevent fraud in pension system or healthcare system. In countries that have a population register, a birth or immigration creates a new ID number, like an SSN that stays with a person. And then all subsequent events in a person's life, including employment, change of address, marriage, deaths, those are all added to a person's individual record linked by that number. So in these systems, a census is done with a keystroke. Rather than mail forms or pound pavement, someone in an office can run a tabulation of the number of active records. The US Census Bureau is actively exploring a system like this to support or at least simplify the 2030 census. Um, overall, we have good confidence, you know, from these three methods in the population numbers for most countries, but we aren't as sure as we might like to be about what's going on in the global south. And I think it's, it's fair to say still that demographers know more about 18th century Sweden because of systems like this than we know about Africa or Latin America in the 21st century. The issue of accurate data is hugely important because it drives the next theme of my talk, population projections. We've heard the phrase, demography is destiny. The Economist magazine loves alliteration, and so they invoke it frequently. Um, as best anyone can tell, the, the phrase was coined during the 1960s by Richard Scammon, uh, a former Census Bureau director, uh, or his co-author uh, in a 1970 book about electoral politics. The, the last quote uh, is not from a demographer at all, um, but someone who was important to the population history of the world in his own way, um, Casanova. Uh, incidentally, the memoirs of, of Casanova are an important primary source for understanding uh, the demographic change and the spread of birth control in France in the late 17th and early 18th century. Uh, Casanova describes the, the use of condoms and cervical caps in French society um, in his memoirs. But getting back now to, to what the demography is destiny, um, these, these are all valid points of view. 
uh, demographers are usually careful uh, to call their prognostications projections instead of predictions. Uh, it's, it's hedging, perhaps, to avoid the curse that awaited soothsayers, according to Dante's Inferno, that they would have their heads turned backwards so as to only see what was behind them. Demographic projections can typically tell you where things are headed on their current trajectory. Whether or not we get there depends on two things. Number one, how accurately we've calculated that trajectory. And then number two, how long things stay on it. So imagine it's like a, a rocket scientist were to tell you, well, if the rocket keeps going in this direction, it will reach the moon, but it might change on its way and skip straight to Mars, or it might just go to deep space instead. That, that's the position we, we find ourselves in frequently as people who do population projections. One of the big takeaways uh, in the report was that 97% of all growth for the rest of this century is expected to occur in Africa. And Nigeria in particular may, under certain assumptions, become the world's largest country with over 2 billion people in 2100. Now the middle or more likely scenario has Nigeria's population still tripling to 750 million. That would put it only behind India and China. But one problem that I'm highlighting today is that there's still a fair amount of uncertainty about what's going on in these three largest countries in the world. So this plot here is, is a mess. It's actually mortality data, but it's an example of what input fertility data might also look like. Um, and this is for Nigeria. Uh, it's got a line that shows the model's best fit, um, but as new data are added from new surveys, um, the forecasts for these countries may sometimes change by hundreds of millions of people every time there's a new world population prospects released as a res result also of, of new, new statistical models being deployed. So is forecasting pointless? No, not at all. Um, actually, a review of UN projections since 1950 finds that they perform very well at the worldwide level. Um, at the same time, most of the growth in the 20th century occurred in regions of the world where there was acceptable accuracy of input data. And, and that may not be the case in the 21st century. Uh, six out of 10 countries that are the top 10 countries by forecast population size in 2100 are in places where there are currently major challenges obtaining good data. But the bright side is that there is a huge amount of knowledge transfer and that the statistical models have gotten much, much better. So as a result overall, I think the gap in data quality is actually closing. Now, another important use of population projections is to make adjustments or course corrections in the policies uh, and in our societies if we don't like what we see. Uh, for example, in the 1970s, uh, Chinese demographers showed projections of the population size to the year 21 or to the year 2000. And the China's leaders were receptive to the notion of how difficult it could be to provide a good quality of life for all those people. So in order to avert that outcome, a set of policies was gradually put in place over the 1970s to reduce the birth rate that evolved into what we all know as the one child policy. Um, more recent projections also of, of population aging and low rates of marriage in China that have resulted from these low fertility rates also certainly played a, a role in creating consensus uh, among policymakers in China to dismantle the uh, fertility control policy in recent years. Now, there are also other teams that work on population forecasts besides the UN. So uh, one of these that stands out is uh, IASA. It's a, a think tank in Vienna, Austria with a very strong demographic research center. Now IASA demographers determined that the most effective way to affect future fertility rates is to adjust the access to education of children around the world today. And they have four scenarios to spell out different things that might happen with school enrollment. Their projections are much lower than the UN's. So they get to about 9.4 billion in 2060, rather than 10 billion in the UN projections. And after 2060, something very interesting happens. The UN projections continue grow the world growth until 2100, 
stabilizing at 10.9 billion, uh, and then and, and Africa reaching 4 billion. But the EASA projections begin to show world population decline after 2060 to just 9 billion people in 2100, uh, and Africa ends at just 2.6 billion. So in order to get 4 billion people in Africa out of the EASA projections, you would have to assume that not a single new classroom is built anywhere in Africa, so that the total number of school slots is capped or even decreases. Education matters um, because there's good evidence that when girls especially are educated, they choose to have fewer children. The UN tries to model the trajectory of future fertility decline based on what happened in countries that already experienced it. But they don't explicitly consider the education dynamic in their forecasts. The takeaways uh, from doing these population projections is that are that global population growth depends on fertility rates more than anything else. Uh, population growth ends when fertility rates decline. The world may or may not reach 10 billion, depending on how quickly fertility rates decline, especially in Africa and India. The UN projects that Africa will not see its fertility drop to 2.5 expected children per woman until the year 2070, whereas IASA expects that to happen by 2050. And the main factor that they think will determine when it happens is to what extent access to education continues to expand. Now, we, we've, we've talked a lot about population growth just now, um, but half the people in the world today live in countries where fertility rate is below replacement level, meaning on average, women are not expected to have even two children. So understandably, concerns have lately begun to pivot to the possibility of population decline and aging. But how do we decide what to do about that? Is it better to live in a world of, of 9 billion or 10 billion? Um, maybe to start with, do, do we prefer the US population to grow or decline? How about our own state? US fertility is around 1.7 expected children per woman and Oregon's lower at 1.5. That's on the level of many countries in Europe. I promised that I would at least try to ask this question, is population growth good or bad? So uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna, let me answer it by going through the historical experiences of some countries that have kind of asked this question before and what they found. A preview of the answer, the, the answer is it depends. It really depends on what is the goal of your society. So let's, let's first consider France. France was the first country in Europe to experience fertility decline. France and Russia were the once the most populous countries in Europe. At the time of the French Revolution, one in four Europeans lived in France. France moved to a conscript army in 1793, and immediately their population size became tied to its military power. The quote appears right here. The first element of power is population. But over the course of the 18th, 19th century, the birth rate plummeted. France experienced natural population decline, more deaths than births, as early as 1855. And by 1870, it had half the birth rate of its neighbor country, Germany. So by 1880, France had fallen from 26% to just 16% of the population of Europe. And partly in response to this shock, France was among the first uh, to develop a population science as a distinct discipline. French politicians um, and people blamed population decline for their disastrous defeat in the Franco-Prussian War in 1870. It was a motivation for France to expand its colonies and to assimilate, assimilate colonial troops into its military and also uh, a lot of immigrants from its colonies into its society. In 1889, France passed a citizenship law that made the children of immigrants born in France citizens very much like the, the US system, uh, which is still uncommon uh, elsewhere in Europe. And another important legacy of this time is the expansion of the welfare state to cover families. So pro-natalism in France, it wasn't a politically divisive issue uh, so much as a unifying one uh, that the left and right could often agree on. 
for the right, it was considered an issue of survival and national security. And for the left, uh, it was an issue of solidarity and emancipation for women uh, and also protection of children. So as a result, during the 1930s, France created family stipends, child benefits that were not tied to working. Um, and over the course of the 20th century, the, the, the connection between population and national security gradually eroded. So you know, now we have the emergence of professional militaries and a, a shift in, in debate, uh, of public debate uh, away from population size to concerns with about population uh, characteristics. So France was became more concerned about the ethnic composition and the linguistic composition of its population and, and less about its size alone. Also, there was a receding threat from Germany after 1945 with the creation of the European community. So French society, society kind of collectively decided that family growth was no longer an existential issue. And while French fertility has gone up and down since then, many of those policies were, were very popular and they, they've stayed in place. And France hasn't been uh, among the lowest countries um, for fertility uh, in, France, in, in Europe uh, ever since. Now let's jump over to China. So China, on the other hand, had very significant population growth leading into the 20th century. Mao uh, did not encourage higher fertility, but he also decisively rejected the Malthusian idea that China would not be able to produce enough food for itself unless it stopped growing. But gradually in the 1960s and 70s, world attitudes towards population growth began to change as people began to rethink whether a billion more people every decade, which was what was forecast then for the foreseeable future, was sustainable. Several influential books in this decade informed a new sensibility that population growth should be limited. The influential 1972 book, Limits to Growth, uh, posited that consumption of natural resources was growing faster than production, and it would eventually overshoot, leading to economic and population collapse. Overall, you get this emerging sense that people, people are not power. In fact, they, they can be a liability for economic growth and technological innovation. After all, China lost wars with Europe and Japan, despite having a much larger population. So China began in the 1970s to implement policies to slow its population growth. The Chinese leadership was heavily influenced by the thinking of limits to growth and several prominent scientists in China called for drastic population control in the late 1970s. So the strictest policies were put in place during 1980 to 85. And since that time, they've been gradually relaxed. Uh, and those, those policies accelerated fertility decline that, that it probably would have happened anyway, but a little earlier as a result. And China's population uh, projection uh, in 2100 now is 1 billion. That's 400 million fewer people than today. In fact, there, there are signs that China's decline may begin even sooner. The UN projected the population in China to peak around 2030, but the birth rate has fallen so quickly in recent years that some analysts think that population growth may go negative as early as this year, 2022. All this could be somewhat vexing to Chinese policymakers. So China faced an inverse of the problem that France did. Whereas France wanted a higher birth rate than wanted to reduce it, China wanted to cut its birth rate and then now increase it. In 2016, the government enacted um, a so-called two-child policy that had little to no effect on fertility. And last year, uh, the government announced a um, quote unquote, the arrival of the three-child era in, in posters, promotional posters like this. I look at the poster and ask myself, where, where are child two and three? But um, the, the policy will probably have even less of an effect. Why, why isn't fertility bouncing back in China? Well, there, there are two reasons. One is technical and one is behavioral. So the technical reason is that the way that the birth rate is measured doesn't take into account when women merely delay births rather than forego them. There are ways to correct for this, um, but they're, they're rarely used and never, absolutely never in the popular press. So to give you an example though of how this works, um, consider Sweden again. 
Sweden is convenient because we can be sure the data are reliable and we can focus on the interpretation. The, this graph shows the fertility rate on the y-axis and, and then two numbers on the x-axis. One of those numbers is the year of birth or a cohort of, of the woman. And the other is the year of measurement of the fertility rate. So the highest peak in the measurement in one year is fertility in 1962. The, the tail end of the US baby boom also. Um, fertility then dipped low during the 1970s. It recovered back upwards in the late 1980s and then fell again in the 90s only to recover in the 2000s. Yet all this time, uh, if you look at the cohort rate, what that tells you is that every generation of women born between 1915 to 1970s had around two children. So the, the real point of this you know, seemingly minor technical issue, it's that policies and academic conditions were never affecting how many children people had, only when they had them. And that, that's a fallacy that uh, if you start looking for, you will, you will frequently encounter in news reports about, about birth rates and, and policies to affect them. The sociological reasons uh, are also important. So the, the failure of the policies in China to increase fertility is because of the flawed assumption that it's the fertility control policies themselves that are actually making fertility to be lower than people want. Chinese fertility is affected by a lot of the same things uh, that, that are true in other countries. High cost of living, uh, less interest in marriage, uh, economic uncertainty and insecurity, especially among younger people, um, comparing themselves to the experience of their parents' generation. And this is why most pronatalist policies will fail. Typically, they're not the expression of the general will. They're attempts by governments to make people act in ways that people can see through as not for their own good. They're half measures like a few thousand dollars payout for kids or, or making birth control difficult to access. But the policies that will work are ones that remove barriers and help people achieve the family size that they already want. Sometimes that takes the form of uh, providing contraception. Um, other times it means providing really meaningful economic security and, and universal high quality childcare. But you can't change someone's wants overnight. Maybe at all. If you have a, a tax system like Social Security, where the system needs more children, but American families don't want more children, in, in my view, you'll have a better luck changing social security than, than changing family preferences. So finally, let's um, consider another country experiencing population decline and aging and ask whether this quote is true. We're gonna talk about Japan. Japan's fertility rate has been below replacement for 50 years. But population decline, uh, interestingly, only started to happen in 2010. I, I think that bears repeating. Uh, it took 40 years from the time that fertility fell below replacement, uh, below two expected children per woman, to the time that population actually declined. And that means that you know, low, low birth rates don't have necessarily immediate repercussions. There is time for societies to react uh, in a level-headed way to what's going on in their population. And in this way, I, I think there's an analogy between demographic change and climate change. It is a big looming challenge that you can't easily, uh, you can't dismiss. Um, it gradually appears on the horizon, seems like it's always far away until one day it's right in front of you. And it's very hard to change at that point. Japan, like many other societies, it has taken some modest pronatalist measures. Um, they've expanded childcare access, they're giving more parental leave, there's child allowances, but they haven't had an effect. And sociologists believe that the culprits now are, number one, better education uh, and better labor market opportunities for women, and at the same time, worsening economic prospects for men, coupled with some conservative ideas about marriage and gender roles that are taking a long time to change and that are responsible for very low rates of marriage and very low fertility. Many Japanese men and women have made the decision for themselves that having marriage and children is not good for them. 
even if it is good for the state. And we should pay attention to how Japan is navigating the coming decades. Between 2020 and 2050, one in four children, uh, one in four countries in the world is projected to have population decline. By 2050, one in six people will be over 65 years old. In 2075, there'll be maybe more people over 65 than children under 15, even sooner if you expect faster fertility declines. Children may someday be a novelty in the same way that the very elderly once were, although that, that day is far off in most countries, um, but there's some things we, we can anticipate happening sooner. A gradual reduction in the depth of family and kinship ties is one. Uh, take Italy, the TFR there is 1.2 children per woman. If that remains constant, um, then by 2050, simulations suggest that only 5% of children may have both a sibling and a cousin. Already, um, you know, I, I put a, a figure here that, that shows some of the, the Chinese words uh, for family relations. There are dozens of words, depending on um, whether it's somebody in your mother's or father's family, um, their age relative to you, uh, their generation relative to you, and their gender. This, this intricate system um, has survived for thousands of years, but uh, a study of primary school students in Shanghai, where the fertility rate is, has been around 1.0 uh, since 1995, find that some of these terms are beginning to fall out of use. Another thing that's happening, um, emerging, another pattern emerging in Japan is remaining active for longer. So retirement ages are being tweaked. Uh, as many as one third of people ages 70 to 74 uh, work in Japan, and that's up from one quarter in 2010. Now this, it makes sense. Uh, you know, since the time that the US social security system made its first benefit payout in 1940, life expectancy for someone conditional on surviving to age 65 has increased by six years. It's now to so someone who's 65 can expect to live till 84. But the most often cited formulation for tracking population aging is called the old age dependency ratio, or OADR. It's simply the total number of people over 65 divided by the number of people 15 to 64. It assumes everyone under 65 works and everyone over 65 is retired. And I don't know about you, but I don't know many 15 year olds who uh, would consider themselves in the labor market. But if, if trends in labor force participation rates by age continue, especially at the older ages, um, the economic burden of aging may actually be much lower than, than that calculation implies. Not everyone will, but if enough people continue working beyond 65, the burden on healthcare and pension systems starts to look manageable, especially if the cost of educating children is going down. Okay, but now I've just committed the error of thinking about this through the lens of the pension system and not as a person. Do people wish to work past 65? I believe some do. Um, I believe those that do don't want to do it in order to show up at Social Security and Medicare. Uh, it probably depends on what career that person had, um, what conditions they could expect to work under uh, when they're over 65, and, and also their health status. So one of the obstacles to confronting aging is how we define and categorize older people. We have many words to describe children at every phase of their development, but the terms we have for older people are monolithic. They refer to everyone 65 plus. But we have programs for infants, preschoolers, school-aged children, teenagers, young adults. Increasingly, we need to recognize that old age is like young age. It has distinct phases, and each of those are gonna have different needs and capabilities and expectations. Demographers have contributed to this by uh, proposing new measures of population aging. So one measure is called remaining life expectancy, RLE. Rather than refer to all persons over 65 as elderly, maybe we should mark as old age, the age at which someone has 15 years of life expectancy left. That would change over time. Um, and it would be different in different places and different for men and women. We also need to take a look at alternative measures of social and economic vitality for a fuller picture of well-being. Returning to Japan, if you measure by GDP alone, 
economic growth has been sluggish. But instead, if you look at the individual level, there's something very different and interesting emerging. Since 2010, Japan has enjoyed the third highest rate of GDP growth per person in the G7. So the idea that growth is necessary to improve quality of life, that we need a larger pie for everyone, is being challenged um, in all kinds of uh, sectors of society and, and in the academy. In a sense, rather than focusing on growing the pie, um, there's an interest in, can we reduce the number of slices and keep the pie more or less the same size? So the story of Japan shows that a country may be able to maintain and even boost living standards without necessarily uh, insisting on population growth. Since 2010, life expectancy in Japan has increased, unemployment is low, and the export market, the economy is as strong as it was in, in the 1990s, uh, 1980s. Now, obviously this only goes so far, um, population aging and decline, it is a challenge for Japan and global, globally. Uh, it does present risks that, that will have to be managed. The pie can't shrink a lot or we're in trouble, but it may be more productive to acknowledge and manage risks like aging than to ignore them or think that they can be reversed by the right policy. And I think at least Japan is providing some suggestive evidence for how a country might be able to remain stable and prosperous and technologically advanced without having population growth. So I want to end with a, a reflection um, and the ways in which Oregon's story is interwoven with this last story about population growth. So here in Oregon uh, this year, we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of SB 100, a uh, bipartisan bill which put in place our unique land use system, which tries to balance growth and preservation. The Oregon Commission, Oregon 2000 Commission, um, in 1978, uh, wrote a report uh, in which they, they had some very interesting things to say uh, about the system, including this. Growth, particularly that associated with economic development, has traditionally been viewed as synonymous with prosperity and a better life. Oregon's rapid growth of the 1940s was indeed welcomed and encouraged to improve the quality of life for most Oregonians who resided in an essentially underdeveloped region of the nation. Great capacity to accept such growth, physically, economically, and psychologically, then existed within the state and the minds of its people. Its short-term benefits undoubtedly outweighed its costs. And what was, what was changing between 1940 and 1970 was not the state's capacity for growth, but the continued appetite. Rather than define population growth as, as good or bad, the architects of SB 100 and the authors of the Oregon 2000 Commission report uh, took the, the stance that uh, population growth would probably be due to factors outside their control. So they recognized that the state couldn't cause or prevent growth, but it could do something to try and protect or enhance quality of life either way. Now, while, while Europe and Asia are expected to see decline or, or stabilization in population, our state is still expected to add another 1 million people between now and 2050. And time will tell whether the Oregon system will continue to shine when it's under even greater population pressure. But in setting the priority on quality of life and taking the stance that population changes should be accommodated rather than encouraged or manipulated up or down, I think Oregon was ahead of the curve and anticipating some of these debates and decisions that many countries around the world are going to start having to confront uh, this century. Well, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the chance to speak with you, and I understand um, that we can get into to Q&A. Great. Thank you so very much, Ethan. This is Tim DeRoche, the uh, Director of Programs for World Oregon. Um, if you could unshare your screen, we can get you back life size. That would be great. Um, so we've got some good questions coming in from the audience, and I'm going to dive in with just a few just to, to kick us off. Um, you touched on this a little bit, but what is more concerning, the boom in population growth and the negative impact this has on quality of life or population decline and the negative impact this has on the labor force, retirement, social security, et cetera? Yeah, that's a great question. And you know, I, I, I thought if we had more time, it would be fun to do a poll. Um, of the audience. I suspect if we put out a poll to the audience asking uh, people which they were more concerned about, um, <clears throat> overpopulation or underpopulation, growth or decline, 
I think there'd be a split. <laughs> and I think that um, you know both viewpoints are, are, are legitimate. Um, growth in itself is neither good nor bad. Um, it, it really comes down to is there a, a consensus view? And we saw that you know uh, France, for example, had reached a consensus that that growth was desirable, and China had reached a consensus that growth was not desirable. Um, and we don't have a consensus like that um, here. I think that we are concerned about um, the sustainability of growth, uh, given you know the the a finite amount of natural resources. Um, but you know, on the other hand, so far. Uh, a lot of the concerns uh, or kind of um, predictions from the 1960s and 70s about, um, you know, uh, peak oil or, uh, you know, uh, agricultural collapse um, kind of haven't, haven't manifested. Not to say that they, that they won't, but the reason that they haven't manifested is because um, as things become more scarce, people have innovated and found ways around them. Uh, so, you know, we no longer consider, you know, wood to be as important to have a resource as it was once, um, you know, plastics emerged. Um, and, and things like that are unpredictable, uh, technological change like that, radical technological change. Um, and I think at the same time, uh, you know, population decline, um, it seems scary, right? It could put these, these burdens on the pension system. Um, but I think depending on how, how you quantify the exact burden there's going to be on the pension system, what I've tried to show with, with the, um, the discussion about the alternatives to this old age dependency ratio, which is usually kind of trotted out by people who have an agenda uh, to show that the, the system is, is unsustainable, um, those calculations are not very nuanced. And when you try to do something more nuanced to assess how big will the burden, what will the actual ratio of retirees to working people be, the problem often goes away. So, you know, I, I think to, to think, think about the, the longer term too. So the dependency ratio we see going up in the next 20 years uh, due to population aging, but retirees are not the only kinds of dependents in society. So you also have children and people who don't work. And if you were to look in the 1940s and 50s, you would actually find a higher dependency ratio than, than is forecast for the future. And the reason that dependency ratio was higher was because women were out of the workforce. So not only were, were uh, people taking care of um, you know, retirees, admittedly limited number in, in the 50s, but they were taking care of a, a huge number of children and uh, family members who were staying at home. Now compared to that economic burden, the burden of aging in the future is actually gonna be smaller. Okay, so you know you touched a little bit on um, uh, education for children and education for women. Is the education factor also affecting men in population growth, growth, or is this really looked at a little bit more through the lens of women and children? Yeah, that's a great question, and it gets to another kind of one, a really important uh, core topic in, in demography um, about how fertility is measured and. Um, there are uh, ways of, of measuring male fertility, but in general, measurement is much more difficult because um, men don't always know how many children they've had. And it's harder to, to measure the effect of anything on male fertility because, um, you know, if, if, if you, uh, yeah, we just don't have uh, precise records that, that can, can tell us, like they can for women, uh, how many births they're responsible for. Um, so that's an important one. And the other, the other reason that we, we tend to be more concerned about, about female fertility is that um, while well, females are the, are the only uh, people who reproduce. So in fact, we've been talking all this time about you know, total fertility rate, two children, and, and so on. But actually, what is a measure of whether or not a population grows is something called the net reproduction rate, which is um, for every you know, reproductive woman, how many additional reproductive women is she responsible for creating? And, and, and that can sometimes be actually pretty different. So we saw in, in, in China, for example, that the fertility rate was already pretty low, but actually when you look at the reproduction rate, it's even lower uh, because some of you will, will know that there's um, a sex ratio imbalance and more men born than women. So for every, you know, even if the, the fertility rate was two uh, in China, it would not be one boy and one girl. Um, it, would be, it would be skewed in favor of boys. And that's gonna make your population growth decline even faster. 
So there are a variety of reasons. Yeah, I know it's it's probably um, there are a variety of reasons we 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 focus on um, on women's fertility rather than men. But um, it's a good question. Yeah. Well, so we have a question from uh, an alumni of our international visitor program about this. Um, is it and, and, and he asks, is it right that when a country falls below a 2.1 total fertility rate for 10 years or longer, that it is in fact uh, essentially irreversible to get out of and, and in essence, uh, a population reaches extinction? I think um, I would put that horizon a little bit longer. Um, and I think we can think of an example I didn't talk about, but let's, let's talk about Russia for a minute. So Russia had a period of almost 10 years of very low fertility, um, which is now rebounding. And you remember I mentioned the fallacy of the idea that policies are responsible for changing fertility. So in, in Russia, they have a program to uh, provide uh, a big cash uh, payout to people um, uh, who, have, who have children. And that has been credited because it happened at the same time as a fertility recovery after about 10 years of very low fertility. But when you look at the cohort fertility, that is to say for like a group of women born in a particular year, when they turned 45 and we look back over their lives, how many kids did they have? That cohort fertility did not decline during the 90s. So it's again, it's an issue of timing. I think we can go more than 10 years. A woman can go more than 10 years delaying births, especially if she only plans to have two. Um, so it does limit how high fertility can get. Uh, because you can't have a cohort return to a level of three or four children, but that's not the the kind of order of magnitude that we're talking about in this day and age. Um, you can you can absolutely have a period of of ten years um, and then a a stable uh, a, a cohort fertility rate of two children. So demography is changing. So I'm curious because so much of what we're talking about are really um, very traditional lenses of male female. How is how is demography being affected and, um, and adapting to really think about transgender and non-binary identification uh, in, in, in the future of, of how they track and how they think about demography? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And I think it's, it's, it's related to one too that comes up even more frequently, which is about, about race, because uh, a lot of it is about identity and, and do these identities track meaningful differences in demographic behavior? So, you know, to put on a really strict demographer's hat, um, if we're looking at population growth, again, we're only concerned about um, reproduction. And so whether or not someone can or cannot reproduce, that's what's of interest um, when we're talking about population and growth. But I think when we're talking about social demography, that's a much bigger sphere in which, yes, there, there are a lot of people uh, interested in um, kind of what, what, are, what are the, um, the the family formation what is what is the health and life expectancy like um, for people who are in these uh, different identities and I, I think that's you know that's a really important area of of study um, from the perspective of wanting to maximize well-being uh, in the population so I think it's it's not it's not a big concern for population growth but um, it is it is a concern for for well-being and um, so in terms of well-being and the, the points towards um, alternative models of GDP, and I'm, I'm curious, so when you look at the work of economists like Joseph Stiglitz, who are really looking at, you know, tossing out traditional metrics around GDP, are demographers beginning to embrace this approach to, to measuring well-being? <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, I think so. Um, you know, I, I can't speak on behalf of all demographers, and and it's really more the province of uh, economists. But but uh, I think certainly, you know, the, the kind of things that demographers are interested in are are things that relate to quality of life. I mean, what is more fundamental to quality of life and 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 well being than than a long life expectancy, life expectancy? So. I think there's been a general movement towards including more demographic indicators into measures of well-being. If you look at something like the, the Human Development Index, um, which is a, an alternative measure promoted by the UN um, to, to kind of, I guess, rank and track countries' development, call them developed or less developed, uh, it, it includes things like life expectancy and, and it, it includes more kind of human development measures. And then I think, um, 
the 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 measure you're talking about um gross national happiness i think is 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 the one um i think yeah it, these these concepts are are really um i think we're seeing the, the inclusion of more demographic concepts that relate to um meaningful and and long and, and happy lives being considered in uh by economists in their their usual sphere of kind of uh, being the ones to to weigh in on this. Great. So the one factor I think that everyone's thinking about because it is in front of us every day is the question of COVID. So how has COVID had impact on demographic projections and how has COVID-19 uh, impacted some communities differently than others and how are demographers studying this? Yeah, that's a, well, that's a big topic. Um, I think a couple things have emerged from studying COVID-19 um, on the demographic side. One is that we know that it, it's had uh, an effect on life expectancy. It's decreased life expectancy uh, in countries that have been hard hit. Um, now, of course, I think one of the things that it's not as well appreciated is the fact that um, life expectancy in the US has already actually been very stagnant uh, in the past decade. So there's something already going on before COVID even came that was halting our progress in, in achieving uh, lo greater longevity uh, for, for Americans. And I think that that's important too. And demographers would, would draw attention to that. It's not, not just COVID. And, and, and once COVID is over, we'll have to contend with whatever it is that's been going on since 2010 also. Um, I think by and large, demographers tend to think of these as, as kind of a, a shock like if we were to look at a time series from the 1918 pandemic and we looked at what happened with life expectancy, it's kind of, you know, heading along a kind of a steady trajectory, then it, it has a huge drop down. But then in the, in the next year or two after, it's it's back up. It's back up because, um, you know, we've contained the pandemic and also because we've actually accelerated the age of death for a lot of the people who've died of COVID, which means that we've, taken a lot of deaths that were going to happen over the next five years and move them up uh, to, to this year. And so that actually could help the rebound in life expectancy in the next couple of years. Uh, and I think similar thing with, with fertility, we have to talk again about the timing versus the number of children. I think a lot of people are saying this is not the right time uh, to, to have kids. Um, you know, maybe a, someone who had a, a kid six months before the pandemic and was thinking about having a, a second is probably going to space their kids out a little longer than they planned on. But we, what we don't know and don't expect really is that COVID will have any effect on the number of children people want. Um, it's, it's far too soon to say that. So I was really intrigued with the, the nuance with which you talked about um, um, older, older citizens. And I, I had never thought about that, of breaking it down into, into different groups. Um, and I'm, I'm interested in what interests demographers and we often hear about you know a certain a certain block of people so is is there a generation that is of most interest to demographers like gen z or millennials and what predictive things are you seeing um, with that kind of a focus yeah well i think about that um i think when we think about generations and demography um we tend to think about the ways in which they kind of cause, you know, echoes or ripples in in society. So, you know, why is there a millennial generation? Why is it meaningful? It's really because uh, the baby boom generation, that the baby boomers, um, you know, uh, were so great a number that even though they their fertility rates, like the the U.S. fertility rates, were declining when they were adults they still had an outsized large generation. So that's kind of, um, you know, when we look at like, something like an age distribution in which generations are marked, we can kind of, I think what's, what's of interest to demographers is looking at the relationships between generations and how things, you know, like, um, you know, how things like uh, a, a shock to the size of a generation, when we look like a, uh, you know, a war that, that eliminated a large number of, of you know, young people uh, like World War One, or looking at the, the 1918 pandemic where young people were really affected, kind of watching and, and anticipating that some years later, what downstream effect that's going to have uh, on, on the population. Um, so I think we're kind of equal opportunity. We're interested in, in all the generations and we're kind of interested in, in their 
relationships to each other. So how are America's demographic changes shifting the electorate and American politics? And I'm curious if you're seeing similar trends in other liberal democracies and or countries that have embraced populist policies around the globe. Yeah, well, I, th I think as you can tell from, from my talk, I'm, I'm a skeptic on, on the effectiveness of pronatalist policies. Um, but, um, you know, in terms of that, that question, so that the genesis of that statement, I mean, demography is destiny, it's a political statement. And the idea was that, um, you know, you could predict uh, changes in, in politics based on uh, changes in the composition of the population. Now, I think demography is important, but, you know, we've seen that it's not destiny, really, or, or if it is, it's not always in the way you expect. So unexpected things happen. Like, um, I think the, the, the assumption about voting behavior by race ethnicity, for example, is proving to be pretty fallacious. So we're seeing that, you know, it's not the case that with the demographic change that's happening uh, in the U.S., that it's it's causing a a, a unidirectional change uh, in in politics. Um, it is it is causing a, you know bifurcation maybe in, in, and and effects that that nobody uh, could have predicted. But um, yeah, I great. Um, well, we've reached kind of our time. Um, so uh, clearly, you've pointed out that statistics are our friends. We should probably pay a little bit more attention to um, all those little numbers that make us dizzy sometimes. Um, but I wanna, I wanna thank you, Ethan, for um, a really, really great talk um, and framing it the way you did. I wanna bring Derek back on to take us out into the day. And I wanna thank everyone for their questions and we will see you uh, next week. Thank you very much. I just wanna echo Tim, fantastic uh, discussion. And I know we had uh, some really positive feedback in the chat from the audience. Uh, I know we're slightly over, but we had so many good questions. Want to make sure we included them. Uh, we this will be up on YouTube next week. So if you have friends who missed it, share this with them because I think uh, it's really uh, a really fascinating talk. Uh, next week we will have, as we mentioned, a special uh, discussion group with PSU grad students on this January twenty seventh at noon. Uh, Tim posted the link earlier. Uh, it's also on our website. That is free event. Um, and, uh, it's, I, you know, especially encouraged that you be a member, but we're, um, you know, come one, come all for that, that event. Uh, and then next Friday is, uh, really a Latin America day. We are having a program at 9 AM on Friday on Cuba, uh, the U S embargo after 60 years. And then at noon, great decisions, talk number three on drug policy in Latin America. So join us next week for more programs. Ethan, thanks again for a fantastic talk. And to all our colleagues and friends at Portland State University, such a great partner uh, organization of ours. All the best, stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you next week.